You are listening to SelfDiscoveryRadio.com with an orchard of wisdom just ready for your picking, filled with illuminating, inspiring stories. Do check out the community and the discovery stores. We are here for you. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Mental Awareness Show. I am your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest today is Steve Andrews. Steve has autism, but he says it's not something that's a detriment, it's something he needs to understand. In actual fact, it is a gift. He's understood that he has strengths with this and talents that maybe he may not have had had he not got autism. We need to actually understand what autism is. You know, the old paintbrush, paint everybody the same. It's a disorder. It's a problem. Autistic people can't ever be productive. Well, if you've listened to any of my autistic shows here on Self-Discovery Radio, you know that I've interviewed some autistic people doing wonderful things, very creative things. And one of the gifts is the ability to see things in a different way. Just because they process things differently doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. They have maybe some other challenges that we don't have, but actually when you listen to it, maybe we do have those challenges. We just call it something different. So let's take the journey with Steve and bring about the inspiration and connect the dots to practically understanding autism and neurodiversity and uh, see what he has to say about it. It's a show of education and enlightenment and celebration. So welcome to the show, Steve. Hi, good morning. Or afternoon or evening. <laughs> right, whatever we are at, <laughs> wherever you are listening to this, exactly. So, it's uh, the practical understanding of autism. Let's try and kind of see if we can actually understand it, because it is a word that's thrown out there. Um, people, it's place a label, but without any actually understanding that there's also so many different levels of autism as well. Would you like to share some enlightenment on that for us, please? Love to start off with. Sure. I mean, my own story, well, I was uh, born at a very young age to my parents so I could be close to my mom. No. Um, (laughs) It was the spring of 2012 when I was living up in Seattle when my life took, you know, that dramatic climax of a movie moment turn, right? Mm -hmm. And... I had heard about this thing called autism, and and at the time, Asperger's, and I'd seen it Facebook and Twitter and some of the online um, non-diagnostic tests and things like that, but things had kind of come to a head in my life, and I made a big list of all the things I'd struggled with in my life and went to see someone in downtown Seattle, and in that first meeting, you know, as if walking in with a big list isn't somewhat indicative, um, (laughs) she said, you have Asperger's. And to call that moment profoundly transformational in my life is an understatement. It, you know, I had lived 33 years of my life at that point feeling fundamentally broken. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I had, despite my career, I've been a software engineer for what, I guess 18 years now. And I've done work for Microsoft and lots of big companies, but I'd faced lots of challenges in life as well. And to finally understand that I'm not broken, my brain just works a little differently, yeah. was... Uh, a relief. Profound, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if people think, you know, when you get to assessed or diagnosed, whichever the word is, you know, it's not that you're embracing, oh, yay, I have a disorder, or I have a disease. It, it, it then becomes a summary of all the things that you are struggling with. And it's an identification. And with that identification, you can really start addressing it and seeing, you know, the, the ins and outs of it. So for you, understanding what you had and understanding where your struggle had come from, I can understand would be a great relief because now you really now can focus in on what you can do to empower yourself with the Asperger's instead of struggling against it. Oh, yeah. I had finally had answers to a lifetime of questions and justification to a lifetime of experiences. And, you know, one of the most beautiful thing that came out of it was Mm self-kindness because I had always felt 
again, that I was broken, that there was something wrong with me, why couldn't I just do this or that or the other thing, and to understand that I'm not, that my brain works a little differently, to understand the challenges I have with social and sensory and executive function and other issues was j- just brought about a, a level of self-kindness I'd never experienced in my life. Yes, because that um, that lack of kindness is because you are different and in this society uh, we're made to look at being different as a flaw aren't we as a there's something wrong with you and we're just it's again painting everybody with that one brush and that we all must be the same it is that diversity it is our differences um, that really makes us unique and really what brings you know the the colorful creativity to the world. Uh, if everybody thought the same and did the same, we'd just be droids and we would not be where we are today. We, yeah, gen- we definitely do live in interesting times. I mm. mean, I, I posit that, you know, Albert Einstein, uh, Nikolai Tesla, uh, Edison, if they were born today, would they have actually achieved the things that they achieved? Yeah. Because they grew up in a much different world where you could be more eccentric, you could be more different and still succeed. And it seems like, it feels like today we're becoming very conformist and we're losing some of that, the arts, the sciences, the creativity, the -the out-of-the-box thinking. Yeah, we're very judgmental, aren't we? You know, if you're different, there's something wrong with you. Um, That means everything you do is flawed. And uh, when we do look at the creativity and we look at the people behind it, they are always very different. There's no box. It's not a question of -of out-of-the-box thinking. They just simply don't see a box. Um, And I think that scares some people because they really, really want to box everybody up. (laughs) In some ways. I mean, I, I don't want to get too philosophical on this like I usually do, but, you know, I think there is an aspect where, given our social roots, that a big part of our identity is fitting in, right? Being accepted, belonging, and in order to do that, you have to be like the tribe. And if you're not like the tribe, right? And that's why people will say, oh, you don't, you don't seem autistic to me. And for an autistic person that kind of invalidates our entire experience, Mm -hmm. right? You don't see the hidden challenges. You don't see the... And that's part of the problem with functioning labels, right? Is that low functioning is hidden strengths but low expectations. And high functioning is hidden challenges, right? I I can drive and I usually pay my bills on time, that kind of thing, but... I, I have a lot of challenges with anxiety, depression, executive function, sensory, social, that aren't visible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the problem with, with life today is everybody's just too, too overloaded, uh, too you know busy trying to follow what is considered the norm, what society is considered the norm, is that we actually don't pay attention you know, to any interior of anything or, or anyone. And if we're really honest, I think we're actually living in a world where there's an awful lot of depression and anxiety and stress now. And anybody that happens to be going through any form of challenge, that is going to be heightened even more so. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if you say you have depression, oh, I get depression too, I know what it's like, but your depression is probably going to be very, very different in the way you react to that. And, I think this is the thing, if we only would ask questions more and try and learn more and try and be more yeah. empathetic towards each other. You know, it's not, you're not asking for a violin, are you? You're asking for people to understand. These are my, my, my challenges, but why don't you look at my gifts? Why don't you look at my talents? And, and, that's, where the, uh, and that's where the autism story has kind of gone awry. Because for... Pretty much the entirety of the autism story, it is focused entirely on the negatives, the challenges, mm-hmm. the, 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 the things that might hold someone back, right? But that's not entirely truthful. It's not telling the whole story because there are also gifts and strengths. And just like everyone else, autistic people have challenges and we have strengths. And if we focus entirely on the negative... What does that do to a person, right? What does it do to anyone, no matter who's got what? You know, if you focus yeah. on the negative. It's what you feed is what grows, right? Indeed. So, you know, if you're feeding um, 
generally what you do find with people with Asperger's or autism that they're very, very creative in a, in a certain area, right? They can be, yeah. And, and we have to keep in mind that, you know, autism is not a cookie-cutter mold no. of a person, right? Every autistic person is unique just like every person on the planet is unique, we all have our mix of gifts and strengths and talents and interests and likes and dislikes and autistic people are no different. But we do tend to see some commonalities uh, with that creative thinking, with mm-hmm. that um, you know different ways of, of approaching problems, and and uh, along with that, a super. Uh, you talked a little bit earlier about effective empathy, but mm-hmm. the other half of that is compassion and empathy. Mm-hmm. And we tend to see that a lot in autism and neurodiversity is a strong, strong effective empathy for social justice, for human rights, mm-hmm. for animals, for caring about the world and caring about people and their problems. And, and that's part of the problem with the way we talk about autism today is if you look at the CDC definition, the DSM definition, it's basically described as a set of social and behavioral and communication challenges. But what I found, and since my diagnosis, I've been doing, I guess, almost uh, six years of research now. And uh, I found that that description is accurate. Mm -hmm. And most of those things, the social behavioral communication, are actually secondary indicators. They can be more more nurture and environmental than than just core to autism. What I've discovered is that core to autism, what autism really is at its core, because there's lots of research out there that will talk about, oh, it's this part of the brain or that part of the brain or it's this one thing or that one thing. But I discovered that what autism really is at its core is a typically active entire nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so that means things like sensory issues, right? For me, I wear sunglasses even on cloudy days because light to me is brighter than it is to most people. Mm-hmm. In a conversation, if you're out at a restaurant or a noisy place, most people, their brains filter out 99% of their environment so they can focus on the conversation or what's going on in front of them. Uh, My brain doesn't. So I hear everything at whatever volume it is, and it can be very overwhelming and taste and touch. And, you know, in school we learned about the five core senses, but our bodies have dozens of senses, right? Thirst and temperature, and there's a really neat one called interoception, And interoception is the ability to feel what's going on inside our bodies. So, you know, bladder, and do I need to go to the bathroom, or am I hungry, or am I stressed or anxious? And interestingly enough, when we're hungry, our our tummy starts getting a little grumbly, and we get a little shaky in the body, right? What happens when we're stressed? Mm -hmm. The same things. Our, Our tummy's a little rumbly, we get a little shaky, and it can be someone with low interoception might have difficulty differentiating between nervousness and hunger. Mm -hmm. And um, I also don't sleep very well. I mean, that's very neurological. (laughs) I've never slept well in my life. I think my record awake is about 52 hours. Wow. Wow. That's a a long one. 24 hours is a walk in the park. I can easily do 24 hours awake. Um, Usually in the in the thirty, I'm still in the green, but um, but so sensory or core issues. We also find very common are gut and GI and digestion issues, and GI sensitivity issues. Um, I don't eat gluten, and I love gluten. Mm-hmm. Gluten is amazing, right? <laughs> but when I eat gluten, I get uh, a foggy head, an achy body, upset GI. I mean, I feel sick. And it's to the point where I don't want to eat gluten because of how it affects me. I I also don't eat yellow number five because yellow number five tends to make me kind of manic and and various things like that. And then from sensory issues, we also have, you know, the wiring of the brain, right, is the, the central nervous system. 
And we find differences across the brain there. There's, there's been a lot more studies using MRI and fMRI technology that have shown that uh, autistic brains tend to process differently. Mm-hmm. Right? It could be asymmetrical processing in the brain. It could be uh, different regions firing than they would for someone else. Uh, any number of issues, including the amygdala. And as we drill down into the nervous system, we get to the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system contains the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, and we're, we're more familiar with them by different names. The, the sympathetic division is our fight or flight. Right. right. So if we go out in, you know, we're on the West Coast, we go into the mountains and go for a hike and around a corner and there's a bobcat, well, what happens, Right. Our, our, our vision changes, our heart rate changes, our respiration changes because our body has detected a threat and we need to either, you know, punch it in the nose or run away or hold very still or take some sort of evasive emergency action. And yet what I found with autistic people, myself included, is that we tend to have an overactive fight or flight response. So many of the, quote, behavioral challenges we see are, are not someone giving us a hard time it's someone having a hard time yes right they may be having a fight or flight response because the pencil is blue instead of red or the cup is too cold or you know we were going to go do this thing and i had planned and prepared for it and now we're not going to go do this thing and that's too much for my system to handle because we're constantly trying to because the world seems so disordered to us We're constantly trying to create order in our minds. And when something changes, it's like knocking down the Jenga blocks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And actually, let's just hit on on that a moment. You see so much across the media, you know, uh, cops um, arresting, tasering, even shooting autistic people because they're reacting. Well, they're reacting because of that, that flight or flight. You've put them in a panic mode. You right. know, you've come at them wrong. And, of course, you know, there still needs to be some training on how to approach somebody that you think that might be having, you know, that moment. And th- to come at them and guns and put your hands up and get down on the ground is the worst thing you can do because it throws, uh, you know, even more into pain. It does anybody, anybody who's, yeah. who's been approached that way. But as you say, it's more heightened with people with, with autism. Um, and it's so mistreated by the police because, of course, there is no training around it. And I think it should be mandatory that there is. Well, actually, there is. There is starting to – there are a number of organizations around the country that are doing training for law enforcement, first responders, um, About folks like that. And some police departments are actually mandating that training. Good. I'm very pleased of, to hear it. I know of at least one that's mandating it right now because it isn't inherently obvious at first glance yes. what might be going on, right? Autistic people have been accused of being on drugs or yeah. being, quote, non-compliant or any number of other things because it, it isn't understood that, you know, they're having a hard time. Mm-hmm. And it may be that in that fight or flight moment, I'm not going to process their commands very well. No. Right? No, because he perceived them more as a threat. Because it it already takes me time in social situations to process Mm -hmm. incoming input, to get the outgoing input. There's times when, going back to sensory, somebody will say something to me, and the first pass through my brain, I hear just the Swedish chef, right? Just gobbledygook. And about a second later, it replays, and I hear it correctly. Now... And that's a normal situation. Imagine in a high-stress, high-pressure, high-fight-or-flight situation, and the, des- the results could be disastrous. And I actually went and got a wallet card that, should I get pulled over or whatnot, I can hand to an officer to say, hey, you know, and it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card, no. obviously. It's not, but it's meant to inform, to inform, to improve the outcome. Right. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it helps the officer know exactly what's going on. So before they immediately, as you say, jump to drugs or, you know, you're doing some sort of criminal thing, it's to actually understand how to speak to you, which I'm so pleased to hear that that training is actually happening. But, you know, it's not just the police force that it needs to happen. Um, you know, we have uh, 
not just autism, but, you know, so many people that have high anxiety, post-traumatic stress, mm -hmm. uh, done numerous shows with veterans on, um, on post-traumatic stress. And that yeah. is not just sh soldiers. It's anybody that's gone through a trauma is going to suffer from uh, PSD, uh, PSD. And it's, and, it's, and interestingly enough, though, with, with trauma, we tend to think of it in terms of shell shock. Yes. Right? yes. One big pronounced moment that, that created a trauma. But trauma can also be a, a prolonged stress. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, an abusive relationship or financial struggles. I mean, over time, that increase in the cortisol levels in the body changes how the body wiring yes. works, right? And we end up in fight or flight and and PTSD and things like that. And the, and the thing is, is people think that it's only if somebody's physically attacked and they don't realize, you know, like we're quote, quote, a sensitive. Um, you know, it's, they don't actually understand how vibrationally abrasive somebody's verbal attack, you know, that tone. Oh, I like that term. It is, it's, oh, I mean, I'm afraid I went through this, you know, in a marriage and it's like, he's a browbeater, what the hell is that? Oh, well, just get over it. Ignore it. You can't because it comes at right. you with such force. You feel like a porcelain doll that is literally shattering. And that's where this focus on the negative, on the challenges with autism can be so detrimental. There's a term I saw a while back that was devastated by disapproval. And what I find is that, and we look at the statistics, and the majority of autistic adults have anxiety, depression, um, Two-thirds of autistic adults have had suicidal thoughts. The, the addiction rates are higher. And in part, we spent, a lot of us have spent our whole lives being told we're doing it wrong. Yeah. We're doing this wrong. We're doing that wrong. We haven't been understood. We've been, um, you know, misunderstood, right, where our intentions have been seen negatively. Yes. Not understood that, hey, you know, I didn't understand or I didn't mean to hurt you or, or, you know, and getting to the, you know, that compassion side again, there, what I found is that the word empathy is kind of misleading. It's really two distinct different things. Uh, the first is um, social empathy, that external empathy, the eye contact, the back and forth in conversation, the ability to understand someone else's motivations is intense, and, and even sometimes the ability to understand how our actions affect another person. And autistic people tend to have challenges there. Yeah. Uh, I, I know I have and continue to in my own life. But the, but the other side of it is effective empathy that compassionate empathy, the ability to care about other people and how they're doing and care about the world. And, and, and autistic people tend to have that uh, in excess, mm -hmm. way, way too much. Uh, I don't watch the news because to me it's just too emotionally overwhelming. Painful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. literally painful. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, my heart's broken every day by this yeah. world. And so, you know, I, but I can choose now, I, you know, on Facebook, I might see a news article fly by and I may go, I'm not going to read that. Yeah. Right. And I think this is something that people don't understand. It's like, uh, no, we're not burying our head in the sand. We know that those horrors and things are going on out there. And there's a certain amount that we can take. Uh, now, you know, I've never been diagnosed um, autistic or, or anything. I just, I was just diagnosed slow. You know, just something wrong with me. <laughs> that was it. That's as far as we've got. But I've always had learning disabilities and, and I see things from a totally different way. I'm very um, empathic. Um, you know, I'm very, very actually uh, vibrationally tuned. So I feel more and I'm much more sensitive to things. Um, yeah. So when I do see things, there's certain things, you know, my, my injustice is going to get out and I'm going to fight for it. And there's some <laughs> yeah. stuff that I just, I can't, you know, I, I can feel that knife in the gut. You know, I can feel pain that they've inflicted on that animal or that person, and I simply can't go there. And then, but there's at the back of the head, your guilt because you're not standing up for them. But you have to learn your filter of where to draw the line. Otherwise, it, it could consume you. And we also can't care about everything. Mm -mm. It, it is impossible mm -hmm. for the human brain to do that. But, but that's also a good thing. If everyone 
was was standing up for autism, who'd be standing up for whales or cancer right. or or homelessness or veterans, right? We we all need different people to care about different things, and and I mean I see that with celebrities a lot. People, you know, kind of attack them for hey, why aren't you supporting my cause? Well, right. they're supporting a cause. That's all we can ask them to do, and, yes. and so many of them do, as we know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we can't all care about everything. No, and we shouldn't either. I mean, you know, it's it's a uh, you want somebody to be authentic in the way they care, right. in the way they're going to stand up. And if they, you know, it doesn't mean they're not moved by anything else. It's that this is the avenue that they've chosen to stand behind or stand up for. And, uh, you know, yes, you know, they're putting all their energy behind that. And that's good because, as you said, somebody else will choose something else and that's what they do. So let us, right. let us you know, um, no, they're not doing it for fame or fortune because they do give a great deal of their own time, very often their own money. You know, um, it's a, it's their cause that they've decided to to stand up for that purpose, and uh, we need more voices out there. And because of those voices, we do see change. We, Indeed. you know, right? And uh, so, you know, we've we've seen people stand up that are famous that have talked about you know OCD or, or autism or dealing with depression and anxiety. This used to be a completely taboo topic. Nobody right. wanted to talk about it. No one wanted. Oh, no, no. Keep you know, keep your dirty linen elsewhere. Just hide it. Close the door on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if anybody had depression, uh, what did they used to call women who went into depression and anxiety? Hysteria. Women's yeah. hysteria. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we, we're not in those dark ages anymore. And at the same time, talking about these things, um, we've also got to understand we're not playing the violin. We're educating. We're empowering, right. and we're celebrating. Yep, indeed. So now that you got diagnosed this and you've done your research, have you looked at yourself in a way where you understood? Because you know you're an award winner with um, with Microsoft. You, you know you've done very very well there. So clearly your abilities, you know, as a, as a software engineer, are very fine tuned and obviously very successful at that. But have you found that there are certain gifts within you that maybe you used to look at as as not gifts, but now recognize them as a talent, as a gift, understanding the strength of it? I think in one way I. Uh... My personality type tends to be the idealist dreamer, mm-hmm. right? And when we don't understand that very well, it can look negative, right? Pie in the sky, head in the clouds, mm-hmm. those kinds of things, right? But but as I've come to understand myself better, uh, I've learned how to take some of those ideas and turn them into something that's more real, right? right? Uh, I've learned that I have – I tend to have – uh, good organizational and planning skills in, uh, I'll, I'll preface that, in some areas. Mm-hmm. Um, not in time management, but <laughs> <laughs> chronoception is a thing that I think I, I was just lacked entirely. I have no sense of time. But, you know, I can take some of these ideas and plan them out and create visions and, and goals and and that kind of planning thinking and being able to look at um, you know, in software development, um, it takes it can take a good decade to really start getting into a senior level because it requires a different way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And part of that thinking involves thinking beyond the myopia of this specific code block I'm looking at right now. Right? If I make this change here, how does that affect other parts of the system? Um, and that larger systems thinking is very important, and that's one strength that I found that I never, I never realized until later in life that that is a strength, mm-hmm. right? Understanding edge cases and boundary conditions versus just the expected path. Right. Yes. Yeah, thinking forward rather than just, you know, uh, think, thinking statically. I have a friend who, who calls this stuff, he has obsessive-compulsive phenomenon, doesn't call it a disorder and because of this phenomenon he has the ability to see things layer upon layer you know dimensionally at at every single angle and literally can build things in his mind 
um, into a complete and utter picture. So he's a mastermind, a master builder, and he builds programs and he builds uh, an understanding of the way you know the mind works and and how we can use it to our best maximum. But this is all come and and he's run multi million dollar companies. Um, people didn't know he had this. They just thought he was eccentric. Right. Um, right. And he wasn't, you know, <laughs> he's got that same time perception, but it was just leave him alone. Something needs to be done. He would get it done intensively and then it was done. But don't try and clock him in at the eight to five. Right. Ha, yeah. Right. So if they just knew when he was plugged in, he was plugged in and very often he works through the night because he likes the peace and quiet of the night. And, Indeed. And there'll be lots of things going on at the same time. He may he'd be listening to music. There might be a video going on and he's doing his work. That multiple sensory, but it's like it's switching on all the lights, and he's just blah, 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 being creative in that. Now, for me, um, I'm too sensitive for that. I need things that are calm, not linear, because I'm never a straight line, but you know, less sense, uh, uh, less stimulation. I need more of the calmness, otherwise yeah. it, sh- it shatters me. But this is when he's at his best. Now, are you a multi-layer type person? Because um, I know that can be very much the, you know, the OCP, but from the autistic side, is that um, one of your things? I think I tend to be more linear, mm-hmm. but but definitely with the quieter environment. I mean, in my office, um, I have blackout curtains and white noise machines, mm-hmm. right, to create that that low sensory soothing environment, and that's where I work best. Um. Yeah, and I I don't really have movies. Uh, sometimes I'll have music going, depending on what the music is and my mood. But not really movies or TV. The 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 dialogue was is distracting from my own thinking yes. about whatever it is I'm working on. That's my escape, actually. You know, watching something is the way I switch off. Um, and then I'm watching something and completely switched off from the dialogue in my head. And when that goes off, the dialogue goes back. <laughs> so it's one way to escape it. <laughs> Yeah, and and for me, I've had to learn how, understanding myself better, understanding the fight or flight, uh, I've had to learn how do I recharge, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How do I step away from that environment? How do I recharge? Part of that is, you know, in the dark and quiet, and and that's true for a lot of autistic folks. And when we, I hear a lot of parents and teachers ask about meltdowns. And it's important to understand the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. Uh, a tantrum is the checkout aisle, and there's a Snickers bar, and the kid wants it, and they're going to throw a tantrum until they get it, right. right? And if they get it, the tantrum goes away because trying to get control of a situation. Mm-hmm. A meltdown is, is the opposite where it's feeling out of control in a situation, right? And wanting to... Uh, just escape that, right? So it might be uh, too much sensory overload or exhaustion or anxiety, and it brings about a a meltdown, but a meltdown is someone having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand how can we help that person de-escalate from that fight or flight, which that's the other side of the autonomic nervous system is the parasympathetic division is our rest and digest. Mm -hmm. After the threat is gone, that kicks back in, respiration, heart rate, pupil dilation, all that goes back to normal. So how can we help folks who are in fight or flight de-escalate? And often that is getting them away from a situation into a calm, quiet place. It's not, they're, you know, again, they're not giving us a hard time. They're having a hard time. How can we help them through that? Right? And in the same token, we, we're on a hike. We round the corner. There's a, a, a wildcat. Uh, and if I – and our fight or flight kicks in and I say to you, hey, oh, calm down. It's not a big deal. There's nothing going on. Just what are you out for? How well is that going to work? Yeah. Right? In the moment is not the time to rationalize or justify and certainly not the time to punish. It's we, – we need a little understanding that, hey, there's a biophysiological response happening. How can we escalate? And then later we can circle back around and talk about, okay, hey – what happened? You know, why did that happen? How can we help that in the future it, to increase self-awareness, to increase um, things like that? Self-empowerment, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the same thing like when, you, when you've got that anxiety um, and, and you're in the, 
anxious moment and it's like well, what's what's caused it and sometimes you don't know you know right. you're just you're so sensitive you're picking up on a vibration or you know a tone in which somebody said something to you and it can set you off and it's the same thing with depression the last thing i want to hear from anybody when you have depression is snap out of it you know right. because <laughs> don't you think we would like to step out of this feeling of despair <laughs> you know if there was a button Indeed. to push we would push it um but i think one of the things that we have to realize is uh what are your triggers what yep. are your triggers? How do you recognize them? What do you do when, when they're switched on? And what can you do to avoid them in the first place? I think that is that self-awareness that we need to have, isn't it? Because we can live a very productive and, and very creative and a very uh, beautiful life, but we've got to be you know, also aware of the things that throw us off kilter. Indeed, as well as our signs that we may be approaching that that meltdown point, that mm-hmm. overload point. Um, for me, I tend to get more, it, it, I don't want to say OCD because that is a specific clinical diagnosis, but I do tend to get more particular about things, mm-hmm. right? I also notice that when I'm starting to approach that, that point of overload and whatnot, that I start doing really bad voice impressions and, and <laughs> accents and, and it's, it's goofy. It's, it's, but I now know that when I start doing that, I need to check in with myself. Hey, right. how am I doing? Mm-hmm. What's going on? Do I need to take a break? Uh, fortunately, well, not fortunately, uh, one of the very few things I regret in life was I started smoking around age 15 and uh, never got carded till I turned 18, but that, that's another story. Um, and for me, smoking has – I'm at the point now where I, – I mean, I love smoking, but I don't want to be a smoker anymore. Right. But f- for me, it's not socially acceptable in, in, a gr- in a group of people to say, hey, y'all are driving me nuts, so I'm going to go outside for a bit, right? But it is somehow more socially acceptable to say, hey, I'm going to go for a smoke. Right. Yes. Right? Yeah. And smoking has given me that way to step outside, get a break catch my breath, do some deep breathing, things like that if I need to. And it doesn't mean it was a bad situation. It was just overwhelming for me. Yeah. Right? And interestingly enough, the other part of smoking, as we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, is one of my favorite words I've learned in this journey is parasympathomimetic. I don't even know to try and repeat that. <laughs> parasympathomimetic. Parasympathomimetic, okay. Mimetic. And it is a chemical that triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest. Well, it turns out nicotine is one of those chemicals. And what I've learned as I've become more aware of myself and my body is that I can feel when the fight or flight chemicals start flowing through my body. And I've noticed that's one of my instant triggers to start smoking. Because that chemical does start flowing. Now, it's, there's many bad things about smoking. Yes. Obviously, I'm not endorsing smoking at all. It's, like I said, it's one of the very few things I truly regret in life is starting smoking. Um, but what that means is understanding that aspect of it for me is there are other pa- parasympathomimetics and there are other ways of triggering our rest and digest, uh, even down to meditation and deep breathing exercises and some mindfulness exercises can really help calm us down to take us out of that place of, of the trigger so we don't need the parasympathomimetic. Yeah, that is the thing, isn't it? For, for me, um, music... You know, headphones on, music. It's I'm not necessarily listening to words. Um, you know, it's maybe not even a particular type of music. I think what it's doing is that frequency of the music is going in and and turning my frequency up, turning my, my vibration up, um, and it calms me down. And if you know, listening to those triggers and knowing what it is. I mean, you know, I suppose instead of you know, um, I'm going out for a smoke, is it'd be okay to say I'm going to go and take a breath. You know, it's uh, we have got to to let people know. Look, if um, my my friend that I was talking about would do that, he would just get up and go for a walk, a walkabout, <laughs> and he'll come back when he comes back. 
But A, he has physical problems because he broke his back. He's meant to be a paraplegic. Um, taught himself to walk again. But he, his body says, I've got to get out and walk. You know, I'm agitated. And it's not because anybody's done anything wrong. He's, right. he's, he's reached a certain kind of pitch you know, in the vibrational level that he needs to download. And he goes and takes himself for a walk. And when he comes back, he's all ready to go again. And I think this is the thing. We have to be open with people. Look, if I say I'm taking a breath and I'm stepping out for a moment, don't take it personally. It's just me needing to go and, and rebalance. Right. I'm a big space geek, right? And certainly there's been a bunch of really uh, fascinating launches recently, uh, SpaceX relanding rockets, things like that. But you'll notice as they do these launches – that as ships approach what they call max Q, which is the maximum, the the part of the flight where there's a maximum amount of stress on the vehicle, Mm -hmm. they dial back the engines a bit Mm -hmm. to reduce that stress to not overstress the vehicle. And then once they've passed that threshold, uh, then they can dial the engines back up, right? But we we don't go to those engines and say, hey, it's no big deal. (laughs) <laughs> right? Just just push through it. You'll be right. fine. Right? Yeah. We understand that there's a challenge there, and we compensate for it. And, and that's, you know, I, I say that, you know, if we have a kid that's into trains, or l- let's say rockets, right, since we're on that subject, uh, we can teach them. Well, I can't. Teachers can. But teachers can teach them everything they need to know through rockets, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, biology and chemistry and math and physics and history and politics and sociology and along the way reading and writing and obviously lots of math. Uh, and who's to say that that kid who's allowed to focus on that interest of theirs, right, rockets, isn't going to grow up and invent a brand new type of rocket, right? But, but – and, and before we throw out the, the, the pie in the sky again, you know, not everyone is Einstein or, right. or whatnot. You know, most of us are not. Right. <laughs> Very few They're of us are. Commodity, yeah. Except I think we all have unintelligence, A-N, unintelligence. Uh, and I think that's where the focus needs to be because maybe that kid grows up and he's a curator at a rocket museum, but he's happy. Right. right. He's fulfilled. He has a purpose in his life. Through that, I mean, I didn't have a single friend until high school. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I didn't have close friends. I didn't have any at all. But it was through getting into computers starting in, in middle school and, and especially in high school that led to that. I got into computers. I taught myself after high school and a little bit of college, I basically sat in front of a computer for like 18 hours a day for six months and taught myself enough to fake my way into my first junior level job. Mm-hmm. Right. But then I discovered the online developer communities and then the offline developer communities. And, and some of my very first friends in life came through those communities of people who, hey, also liked this thing I liked. Right. So there was something in common, something relatable. Yep, we had that common foundation, yep. and, and that's where I circle back to with everything is we have to focus on the strengths. Yeah. Because our strengths is where we all find careers, we find friends, we find rich and fulfilling lives is through our strengths, right? And the example I give is if somebody is diagnosed with diabetes, the entirety of the rest of the story of their life isn't that they might go blind or have a stroke or, or whatnot if they don't manage it well, right? What do we do? We give them knowledge and understanding about the challenge they face. We give them tools and sources to help mitigate that challenge. And then we send them on their way to live their life, mm-hmm. right? Not entirely focused on the diabetes. They're focused on, again, their person, their gifts, their strengths, their talents, and reaching that rich, fulfilling life. And that's where we need to get to with the autism story. Right. Going back to your rocket ship guy, you know, the thing is, is when, when we actually teach children, some, you know, the math, the science, the, the logic, the everything around something they're interested in, it doesn't mean they'll go off and be a rocket scientist, but it does mean that they've actually learned everything about that rocket, that they will make them just as inquisitive over the next thing that they're interested in and want to know more, not just the surface, yep. but what, how does it work? Where does it work? What's the math of it? You know, what's this on it? How do I write up about it? You know, it just, it, I think if there was a less focus on, you know, everybody trying to do that, I was taught that way. I mean, I couldn't be taught any other way. Um, 
I mean, when I sat down with te- a teacher that talked philosophy and, uh, and talked, um, hmm. you know, uh, channeling, because that's the way I was right from the word go, I had beautiful conversations with my teachers and I would come out with more knowledge than I had done with the eight hours in the classroom. Right. Right? The thing is, knowing how a child learns and then tapping into that and writing it and not insisting that they learn the conventional way. Because we're even finding the conventional way is not working for kids that are considered normal. Right. Although, to be fair, the, uh, I've discovered that the only normal people out there are those you don't know well enough. <laughs> I like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I always kind of consider normal, you know, um, it, haven't embraced the extraordinary yet. Um, because we have extraordinary in all of us. You know, there's something in all of us. So, you know, I've always taking human beings as a say a musical instrument and we it is for us to 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 learn our musical instrument understand the gift of it is you know to master it and then bring it to the orchestra and when you're a part of that orchestra you're in sync with the orchestra and when you play together you create this symphony that has a ripple effect out and you know there's always somebody that's going to have you know the spotlight on them they're the soloist you know or particular instrument through whatever piece that's going to stand out above the crowd and that's okay but it's i think it's embracing who we are and what we've got you know you've been given a gift of of autism and in understanding what that gift is and how you think how you see life what your parameters are you can really concentrate on your gift and honing it in so that it becomes part of that orchestra um it's really important i like that example too because uh, the orchestra example, because you'll notice how everyone is not playing the oboe. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, people are playing the violin, the cello, the yeah. Uh, we need that wide variety of instruments in order to have a, a beautiful symphony. And different right? type of music, and different kind of conductor. You yeah. know, and and this is the thing is this is the beauty of, of music itself is that it it is. <sighs> transforming but it also has no language no language at all it is a beautiful vibration that we dance to in our spirit and i don't think there's anybody that can listen to music that isn't set free um and it's a way of of expressing ourselves and it's interesting that you know well i found autistic people doing pretty much every job under the sun including some salespeople mm-hmm. I, I never would have imagined that a few years ago yeah um i mean my own limiting belief but still uh, uh but what i tend to find autistic people tend to go uh one of three paths the first one is stem careers Right, science, technology, engineering, mathematics—that that logical thinking and 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 the other skills required for those kind of careers can be a big draw. Mm-hmm. But but not everyone has that. Not every, not every autistic person is going to be a software developer. Right. I mean, there's a lot of press these days about companies, software companies hiring autistic people as engineers. But not every autistic person is an engineer. Right. Right. The the second avenue I find autistic people can go, not can go, but do go, um, is the arts. Yes. Music, painting, acting. Uh, I once had a conversation w- with a therapist who practices out of Beverly Hills, and she made a comment that we were amazed at how many people in Hollywood are autistic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I look back at her and go, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I have a few guesses, but no. Um, <laughs> but the arts are a big draw. Yes. Right? Acting, music, theater, and, and even the behind-the-scenes stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, the behind-the-scenes technical stuff sometimes in the film and television industries. Um, the third path I find is entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And because many of us have struggled in the traditional workplace – uh, you know, despite my career, I have struggled a lot in the traditional workplace. And some autistic people go down the path of entrepreneurship so that they don't have to deal with the challenges in the traditional workplace. And they can do something around what they're passionate about. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've interviewed um, uh, autistic blogger, 
he has his own blog thing and and how i liked him is that he did it the old fashioned way he he did four hours of you know collective music and coming up next and uh, and he's also a posty a postman and mm. uh, you know and it's a wonderful personality um another autistic person along with her mum they both wrote books mum wrote a book on raising an autistic child and she wrote a book on being one and she's a graphic artist and uh, she's an author and she's graduated as a graphic artist um and uh, you know there's been a few others and the thing is, is uh, and there's been a couple of people who only like you discovered that they were autistic later in life and then it became such a relief because you know they thought, oh no there isn't anything wrong with me there's a reason why I'm like right. I am and yeah. uh, you know again people think well you know aren't you sad you've got that diagnosis no it's an explanation of understanding why I'm not the same as everybody else yeah, and that's where we have to break some of the stigma and some of the misunderstanding, right? We have to get beyond awareness mm-hmm. because awareness without understanding can be d- dangerous. Mm-hmm. It can create those stigmas. We have to get to ex- understanding and acceptance. Yes. And, you know, the thing is when we, talk, you know, we do these shows, mental awareness, you know, talking about mental challenges, you know, those challenges aren't necessarily always to do with you dealing with your autism. It's to do with other people dealing with your autism, where the challenge can be, right? There's been some interesting studies recently around that very same thing, Mm -hmm. where in one study, within seconds of meeting an autistic person, a neurotypical would determine them less worthy of interacting with. Within seconds. Yeah. And, And it's just, you know, and it suggests that some of the problems that autistic people face aren't due to autism or any shortcomings or failures of them as a person, but rather society's challenges, let's say, in including everyone. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm considered an extroverted person but I'm actually very much an introvert and uh, it's a different face that I put on when I'm out there Uh, you know um, if I'm channeling that's great I'm channeling that's what you're going to get if it's me stepping into me you know I'm literally shaking like a leaf um, out (laughs) there and but yet people think I'm very gregarious and outgoing you know I don't have that problem (laughs) you don't know what's going on inside yep yeah the hidden the hidden challenges yes Exactly. Um, yeah, I think of it in terms of I'm an introvert because I recharge alone. Yes. But I love people. Yes. Right? I love yes. meeting people, hearing their stories for short blocks of time, and then I got to go recharge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, people, I'm, I'm sharing a house at the present moment because I recently moved to Victoria um, in BC. And uh, until I knew where I want to go, you know, go to share, find room and see where it is. But for me, that peace and tranquility. Um, they say, well, are you sleeping all the time in your room? Because you're quiet. Well, I've got the headphones <laughs> on. I'm either watching something, doing something. I, you know, I will find after a show the headphones are still on and I'm busy doing admin stuff and I'm not even aware of it. I actually yeah. love silence. You know, I love that quietness. Yeah. And then when I'm out there, I can let me out of the bag. But then, as you said, mm, time to go back in. <laughs> the energy's spent. <laughs> I've got to go back and recharge. Yeah. And People misconstrued that energy sometimes. They're thinking, well, you've got all this energy. Why don't you do this and do that? I know I can't. Don't ask me to do a three-day event. I couldn't do it. My energy level would not allow me to do that. Yeah, and that's where some of that self-kindness has come in for me Mm. too, is even with my own scheduling. Yes. Right? I could do a day full of events, Maybe. Uh, you know, I need to recharge a few days beforehand and probably for quite a few days afterhand. Yes. But, but I couldn't do like five days in a row no. of all day meetings and interactions. And, that, and that's, that's part of what makes a traditional workplace challenging for folks is, is, you know, the sensory issues, especially with this push towards the open office space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I was going to say that much less kindly, but (laughs) the push towards the open office space has made, because I hear every sound, I smell everything, the Uh light is bright, all that stuff is so distracting, especially for a highly highly cognitive job like programming. Right. Right. And then the social expectations and the politics, which I never understood. I would would tell the senior vice president that they're wrong, Mm -hmm. right? 
and I wasn't trying to be a jerk. I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't understand those Parameters political right. boundaries. Mm-hmm. I thought I was being helpful and informative so we could do a better thing, right? And unfortunately, egos come into play. Oh, of course. Which is what politics is, is, is egos. But, and, and then the executive function, right? Time management, organizational skills, uh, and there's a whole slew of things that fall under that umbrella. But that's where, you know, but it ha- the challenges I've had haven't been because of my technical capability. It's been because of all the things around our job that aren't our job. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I-, I completely agree. I've worked in all sorts of places. Um, and, you know, I'm probably pretty close to double your age. And uh, I've worked in many organizations and never could stay long. Um, because, you know, because of that, you know, uh, A, the time thing. I never know when I'm going to sleep. I can be awake all night. And then the next day I've got to get up and do shows and things like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, well, why don't you just meditate? Or why don't you just do this? Or why don't you just do that? No, you don't understand. When I'm on, you know, you know what I'm talking about? When you're on yep. and your mind oh, yeah. is going, there is no off button. It's downloading. It's doing its thing. There is no off button with and the more you fight it, the more it, you know it gets. It's, it's you've stepped into your creative thing, and that's it. It's running on its own thing. The yep. universe doesn't have any time frame, right? It doesn't work by the clock. We humans do. <laughs> and as yep. I'm tapping into the universe a great deal of the time, they go, "Oh, good, you're open." <laughs> Boom! There's the download. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm definitely a crack of noon kind of person, mm. and it's just I've tried to fight it before, and I it just it makes it worse. Yeah. When I try and fight it, I can't function as well when uh, I try and fight it, when I try and do that typical schedule. Uh, and, and it's interesting, too, that you know, so many meetings and stuff are morning. And you know, while I have a slightly different definition of morning, um, only about 25% of the population are morning people. Yes, right. 25% are night people, and about 50% sit in the middle of, Kind of, eh, whatever, in, in the middle, right? And it's just, it's always been kind of fascinating to me how the the morning people seem to set all the mating times. Yes. <laughs> when the 75% either don't like it or don't care. Right. Well, I don't start a show before 10 or 11 a.m. You know, that hour beforehand is all my admin and my email and getting my mind set into something. And uh, then I start getting into shows, and I have certain times that I do it. I will go out of that time if we're talking about somebody overseas or this or that, but, you know, those are my regular hours. Plus, you know, I also switch off at the end of the day. This is work, otherwise it would be so easy to carry on. And then I find trigger, trigger, you know, you, yeah. you've got to stop. And I think one of the voices that we have to stop listening to is everybody else is saying, but I do it this way. Right. That's your way. We have to honor the way that works for us. Getting on the treadmill is your thing and doing a meeting on Skype, great, go for it. But if I'm not that physical um, and if I'm not that this and not that that, that is because I know my body, my parameters, my triggers, and I'm going to push me as far as I know I can. And if I push any further, I'm the one that's going to pay the price, right? Yeah. And that also comes back to empathy, right? That ability to understand that, hey, not everyone is like me. People process the world differently. They interact with the world differently. They communicate with the world differently. You know, there's different neural subtypes of people. And understanding that's pretty important. There's a show on right now about a young doctor with autism. Um, And when I look at that, I don't look at that as atypical autism, but more autism with OCD. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't. Okay. So really, they've they've got the guy, it's totally non-interactive. He calls things as he sees them. Yes, yes, you're going to die, <laughs> you know, because he sees yeah. the medical thing. No filter there. But also there is a certain thing about him where everything has to be in its place. He doesn't like things out of its place, eat the same food, which I think is, you know, one thing I think people need to understand with autism, there are the autistic people that have other issues along with it, like OCD or even something yep. else, and they're multiple layered. And those people that are really, you see, you know, um, really out there talking to themselves, having really difficulties, it's because there's more than one thing. Yeah, and they're typically called comorbid, 
mm. conditions, right? I don't like that word because it sounds, cool. well, yeah, sounds morbid. Cool, but- <laughs> I, I say co-occurring. Right. right. So epilepsy, seizures, yes. we see uh, OCD. A, a lot of things we see as co-occurring, but even, you know, a, there's still some people out there who think that autism means intellectual disability. Mm-hmm. It doesn't at all, right? Just because someone may be non-speaking doesn't mean they're not intelligent. Right. And, and autism is still catching up to the, the deaf population and the blind population, where it used to be deaf people were considered uneducable. Right. And, and institutionalized or even worse. And today we understand that all it means is that they're deaf. Right. right? <laughs> That's it. Yes. You know, and, and I mean, the, the social boundaries society is set up is if you don't communicate in a typical fashion, you're kind of deemed low intelligent and ostracized. So, you know, non-speaking autistic people face a lot of, you know, all the same challenges we talked about. Mm-hmm. And they also face a challenge of they communicate differently. Yeah. Right. Behavior is communication. Everyone communicates. It could be uh, eye gaze technology. It could be uh, uh, a letter board. It could be typing. It could be any. Everyone communicates. And so it, it's important to help foster communication, right? It, it, but all those other challenges are the same, the executive function, the sensory, the social. Uh, and, and But the one other challenge some folks face is a disconnect between the brain and the body, mm-hmm. where the brain tells the body to do something and the body doesn't do it. And when you take someone who is non-speaking, and then, as one, as one person put it, he is uh, stuck in the body of a six-foot-tall drunken toddler, mm. right? Because the body wasn't doing what the brain told it to. But intellectually... I mean, we've seen it time and time again where a non-speaking person has, especially in today's, with technology today, it's, it's Stephen amazing. Stephen Hawkins. Yeah. And Carly Fleischman and so many others who have found communication through technology. And up until that point, no one thought they were even aware of the world, we've let also, alone... Yeah, let alone being able to communicate in it. I mean, we've also seen cases where... You know, there was this five-year-old uh, who could not say a word, couldn't interact with the family, nothing, but get it on the piano. Suddenly he's, you know, playing Mozart and, yeah. you know, and playing brilliantly, you know, and, and uh, just had to hear something could go out there and do it. And that's, you know, the way they communicate. Um, do you remember the movie Shine many years ago? Oh, not offhand. Uh, you know, it, it's... Um, uh, gosh, I can't remember the actor, but brilliant. It was an award-winning show and very, very good. And, it, you know, it's about a, a young man, brilliant pianist, um, but his father had such discipline and control over him that he pushed him over the edge and yeah. he developed such problems. And, of course, so he was considered, I don't think even they used the word autistic, but definitely damaged, mentally damaged and off. But I think there was a classic case of somebody who is, you know, highly gifted autistic in his style, but they the mismanagement of him instead of the nurturing of him, you know. Yeah, author- authoritarian approaches yes. oh, are generally uh, detrimental mm-hmm. for autistic people. Mm-hmm. They don't have the desired intended effect. Mm-mm. Absolutely no. Throw, throw back into flight or fight, panic. Right. Absolutely, totally. Um, you know, we, Mike was my, my ex-husband that used to say to me, you get more from honey than you do from vinegar. And, you know, I think that is kind of the approach where, you know, if you're nurturing and you're sweet, we're going to be open and receptive. But if you come at us with the, you know, with the vinegar, um, no, it's not our taste. So, um, But I think we could also take a tip of that in everything in life, couldn't we? We could all oh, th- be a lot more kinder to one another in the way we approach each other. Indeed. Absolutely. So... In summary of, of this today is please do not, just because somebody has some form of, of um, autism, immediately write them off or pigeonhole them or look upon them with a disability. They just function on a different vibration in a different way. And why don't you take the time to find out what it is? Ask them. You're not going to be offended, are you? Me? No. Right. 
because at least you've then been able to say to someone, these are my boundaries, these are my parameters, you know, and then that means you're giving the other person that knowledge that I can interact with you on this level, but don't ask you to go over there because that's not your ar arena. And then that doesn't ever have to be something that's uncomfortable down the road. Yeah, I don't do night clubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Not going to dance to boogieing to the night away. <laughs> well, A, I can't dance, but B is I can't hear anything. Right. Now, now, if it was me alone in the room with the loud music, that'd be fine. I, right? yeah. But then people want to actually try and talk in that environment, and they put their hands over someone's ears, and they're yelling, and somehow everyone else can hear that. I can't hear a thing. No. All the sounds muddle together in my head, and I can't make out the words that they're speaking. Now, um, you know, I thought I was just going deaf, but I've always been like that, and I have a little bit of hearing drop, uh, but I have, if I'm not reading your lips, I can't hear you. Now, one-on-one, -on -one, perfectly all right. The moment there's any background noise, you yeah. blend into that background noise, and the only way I can hear you is to read your lips. Otherwise, it, it can really be very, you know, detrimental sometimes because you, you know, you're answering something that you think that they've said <laughs> and they haven't. Or, you know, you learn to smile and nod and go, ha, 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 and hope that it was a good laugh, not a wrong right. laugh. <laughs> but, yeah, um, again, these are just simple obstacles that we have to go over in life. And everybody has some of their obstacles and it's don't be ashamed of your obstacle you know don't be embarrassed about your obstacle and let people know around you look these are my obstacles but this is my gift and please as focus much on as, that as much as someone feels comfortable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right I do fully believe in people's agency to determine whether or not they want to tell the world yes. whether they're autistic or depressed or whatever the issue is, that's their own story to tell. Yeah. Right? But, and there are challenges. Not every employer out there is understanding and accepting. Oh, boy. That's true. Right? So there is, you do kind of have to weigh out, do I want to disclose or not? Yep. And, you know, honestly, if you are in that situation that you are having to hide and you are back against the system, you know, it, it is time to look elsewhere. You know, honor yourself. Stop putting yourself through the struggle. You know, there's other areas that you can go to where you can really honor, you know, your own vibration there and not have to put you through this, yourself through the stress every day. Indeed, it might just be, unfortunately, I, I mean, I, I tell people that, you know, finding a job is like dating, right? You're trying to find that good fit for both sides. Yeah. It, they might be a great company and you might be a great, uh, uh, let's say, software engineer, and it doesn't mean you're going to be great together. And it may be that they're just not ready yet to understand and accommodate something like autism. And unfortunately, that's where some companies are today, mm -hmm. right? But there are other companies out there where folks have been successful, and more and more companies today are starting to get on board with this idea of, you know, what if we were more accommodating, more accepting of autistic people? Right. Are there any organizations that people can turn to or report? Have, did you get, turn to any, or was this your own journey? This has been my own journey, and I think, I mean, as an ad hoc kind of thing, I've found other autistic people, especially online. Yeah. Right, Facebook or Twitter or or other avenues online who I can connect with and I can, you know, it does end up becoming kind of a a tribe in a way. Yeah, exactly. Right, and that's one of the problems with autism and the understanding of autism is there's what has been coined the double-blind empathy effect. And so it's often said, incorrect, that autistic people lack empathy. Right, and we've already talked about empathy quite a bit, and mm -hmm. and we lack, we can lack some of the social empathy, that's for sure, but it's also been said that we lack theory of mind, and theory of mind is the ability to understand another person's motivations, intents, what they're thinking, and that's kind of true, but not entirely, because what I've discovered is that it's not a autism thing. Mm -hmm. It's a humanity thing, mm -hmm. right? In that 
neurotypical people have as much trouble understanding autistic people as autistic do people do of understanding neurotypical people. Right. And the reason for that is that double blind empathy effect where when you're in a around similar neural subtypes than you. You know, your motivations, actions, thoughts all kind of come from the same place. Right? The reason for a behavior is likely same. And it makes it easier to guess because it turns out no one has this great super mind reading ability. Mm -hmm. What we do is we project ourselves onto someone else and say, why would I be doing that behavior? Why would I be acting that way? What would I be thinking in that situation? And when you're with people who are in a similar neural subtype, neurotypical, let's say, chances are you're going to be most likely right. Yeah. Right? And what happens is when we cross neural subtypes, the reasons for behavior, the communication reasons, all that stuff are for different reasons. And so when we try to project, we're wrong, right? We might, looking at, we might look at someone having or, – or a kid might be having a meltdown and someone might say, oh, that kid is just poorly disciplined, right? They need to be uh, disciplined better or they're just acting out or being a brat because – Maybe from a neurotypical standpoint, that's why a kid would be acting that way. But for an autistic kid, it may be because they're having a meltdown, right? They've, mm -hmm. They're getting too much. They're feeling out of control. They're having that fight or flight response. And so it's interesting that this theory of mind, kind of, it kind of goes both ways. Yes. I recently did a series on narcissism, which was really interesting. Very, mm. very interesting. And, you know, when you talk about empathy and understanding, uh, there's an incapability with narcissists. You know, it's me, myself, and I, and as long as I'm all right, uh, it doesn't matter what it costs anybody else. And uh, they're always on the attack because, uh, you know, uh, because they always believe people are attacking them. They're right. Everyone else is wrong. And, it, you know, it, it's not that they're bad people. It's, it is that they're just firing on those cylinders, and there is absolutely zero empathy uh, for anyone else in there, which, um, you know is a challenge and interestingly enough going back to you know having compassion for people i find that even narcissism tends to come from things like trauma yeah that yes. in some ways they're also having a hard time mm -hmm. not necessarily well not necessarily giving people a hard time and, and it's kind of hard to make that jump because and that doesn't mean that in one of those situations, from my perspective, that you stay in a relationship with that person or you necessarily remain friends with that person, right? That may not be healthy, but I think it is important to understand, um, you know, I think in order to understand an antagonist, we have to understand why they see themselves as the protagonist. Right. Yes. Well, when we have narcissistic uh, people, very, very often uh, they've become that way because they had narcissistic parents um, and uh, it's you know not taught the empathy and, and constant rejection from parents or mm. you know you're not good enough you're not living up to my image and uh, you know it's it, there is always a history there in everything there's a history there but um, yeah. you know, with um, you know autism it's like you know dementia is something that comes around a great deal from head trauma where Alzheimer's is more of a hereditary thing in the genes. So, hmm. you know, we're, we're really, I really think what we have to do with humanity is, is, again, not paint everybody with one brush. Take the time to get to know what, you know, what these different things are, what people are. Fundamentally, we're all looking for the same thing in life, isn't it? We're looking to love and be loved, living a purpose, knowing that we've got something to get up for every day that we look forward to, to be a part of the community. We're all looking for the same thing in life. But yep. because we're different, you know, we're not all um, the same color, the same faith, the same sex, the same everything else. Um, we're going to approach life differently. And I think that's what makes life so intriguing and so beautiful. Or all the different colors that we are that we bring to the canvas. You know, what beautiful paintings we can create when we celebrate each other's contribution to it. So in closing off, what would you like to close us out with? Oh, maybe a song. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> a tap dance. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. And please do give your, give your information and get hold of you as well. Yeah, you can... 
post that in the show notes or website, um, the websites, email. That's that kind of thing. I mean, my email for the autism stuff is steve at steveandrews.me. It's also the domain for that. And my company, I, you know, I also have a software company designed to successfully employ autistic adults. Yay. And that is at platinumbay.com. Excellent. So it's steveandrews.me or platinumbay.com. And then close us off with a little wisdom. Oh, that's too vague. Um, <laughs> what would you like us to go home with? I think a lot of this really comes down to understanding the strengths someone has and how to fo- recognize those and foster those because that's where we all find rich and fulfilling lives and positive social connections and purpose and meaning. Mm-hmm. Don't throw everybody out, right? Just because they're different. Yep. Now, he's also an autism advocate, speaker, and author. So, um, you know, please go and look at his site, steveandrews.me, uh, the plan bay.com, and, uh, you know, book him to come and speak. Um, as you can hear, he speaks very eloquently and very concisely and can educate you greatly. And, uh, you know, for people who are, you know, autistic or Asperger's or on the borderline, who don't even know they're that, you know, it, it may be a good conversation to have with you and kind of have a better understanding of, um, you know, of what we can possibly be and how we embrace it. So thank you, Steve, so much for being with us here today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Me too. Folks, time to be a little kinder to one another. Open up, ask questions, don't assume, and let's have a little understanding because that's where the empathy and the caring comes from. Until next time, folks, bye for now.